Welcome to another episode of Simon Says, where facts come first. I'm your host, Jenny Simon. We're going to have a little bit of update. We have a little bit of kind of a breaking news and, 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 and the update. And then we're going to move into the meat of the matter. So we'll take a quick break and come right back. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. Welcome back. Now, in the news this past week, uh, our Prime Minister had traveled and so... Um, there was a press release, okay? Now, I have with me here a, a short press release, of course, um, compliments Linda Straker. And I am going to read that to you, for those of you who didn't even know the Prime Minister traveled, because it was a kind of a sneaky thing in the, in the sense that you just heard it by the way and the release was out and he was gone or if he didn't leave before the release came out. On Monday, October 7th, a press release on the Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell's Facebook page informed the nation he had left Grenada for Rwanda. And in his absence, Finance Minister Dennis Conwell would be the acting Prime Minister. However, Although he left the country, he canceled the trip midway because of an outbreak of the Marburg virus disease that was confirmed in Rwanda on September the 27th. Marburg virus disease is a deadly illness related to Ebola. The, the disease does not have any approved vaccine or treatment. It was first confirmed on September the 27th, and as of October the 6th, the outbreak had infected 56 people and killed 12. According to the World Health Organization, WHO, the Marburg virus is transmitted to humans from fruit, bats, and then through contact with bodily fluids of infected individuals. Now, the Prime Minister left for Rwanda. Didn't he know then about the virus? I mean, I don't know if it's a press secretary, his executive secretary, whoever, the, the, um, the Bajan, uh, head of security in his ministry, somebody had to investigate what's going on in Rwanda to before he leave. Now, this thing is in international news, this, this virus, right? So, anyways, he left. Uh, if you go now to look for the press conference, the, the press release, I should say, I'm sorry, the press release from the Prime Minister's office, you can't find it. They removed it. So even if you press on it, if you click on it, you get nothing. It's empty. They removed it. So after that is done, we have no idea where the Prime Minister is. He did not come back to Grenada. And we, as a people, had no idea where he was and or is and of course with it being removed we have to ask the question who is the acting prime minister is it still minister Cornwall until the prime minister get back because the release has disappeared it's gone right we have no idea as a people where our prime minister is or who is our acting prime minister So right now, 
as of this morning, something showed up in my inbox. And it showed me, which I'll share with you, photos of the Prime Minister, his kids, his daughter and son, his um, executive secretary, you see standing on, 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 on one side of him and um, the, well, I'm not sure. We were never told if Mr. Teddy St. Louis is an advisor, if he works for the government of Grenada, or if he's just a colleague and friend of the prime minister. But there is Mr. Uh, Mr. Teddy St. Louis, they're on the trip and they are taking photographs in Nigeria. They're in Nigeria at the moment. Look at the photos. Just to say here, Nigeria is on the west coast and Rwanda is on the east coast. They're not neighbors. So if the prime minister had gotten to, which we know he didn't, to Rwanda and said, well, let me go. Or he came close to and heard of the outbreak in midair uh, and decided to go to to land in Nigeria instead. No, but he went to Nigeria, which is on the West Coast. So was that a planned trip to Nigeria? And we just wasn't told about it. Because I'll tell you something. Maybe the day before the prime minister left, when we here in Grenada knew nothing about his trip to Africa, I got information that he was going, he was traveling to Nigeria. Then when uh when the the release came out, right? That's when it said we wonder to a Bishara conference. He was going to a Bishara conference in Rwanda. So I got a little puzzle there and I said, well, this person didn't give me right information. The man is not going to Nigeria. Lo and behold, Nigeria was, was, was in, in the schedule. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. And I should have known because the person who, who told me of it knows what's going on in Nigeria. Although at that point, they were, she was in, in, in the UK, but she told me what was going on in, in Nigeria, right? So he went over to Nigeria. Just again, we want to find out if that outbreak, if the outbreak started when the prime minister was in mid-air. In the photos you see there, the prime minister visited the Dangote group in Nigeria. Now, the Dangote group is a multinational industrial conglomerate fun, uh, founded by Alkio Dangote. He is the founder, the president, and chief executive of the Dangote Group, the largest conglomerate in West Africa. As of 2021, Nigerian billionaire Alkio Dangote is the richest person in Africa. And the African countries with the most billionaires are Egypt, South Africa, and Morocco. Folks, it's a bit concerning when even with the trips of the prime minister, it seems like we've been deceived. It seems that there's some kind of deception going on there. And that behind the scenes, things are planned and they're letting us know what they want us to do with the prime minister's traveling, right? It's school time, he has his kids with him. Were you taking your kids to Rwanda? even knowing about the infection that you didn't tell us about until you made air. 
to the to, to the to the conference were you taking your kids to the conference with? Is this a planned uh social trip, personal private trip, which we can't I mean that happens. He's he's an uh, a human, he has he can take a little vacation as well with his kids and visit the richest man in Africa and visit some of his um industries, which he has many, 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 many. Um, and so this here, in the words of uh, of Alcino Hall, hmm, we have to wonder what is really going on. Now, there are some other things concerning this gentleman, this richest man in, in Africa, to do with countries and the elections and and da 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 da, da right? And um, we have an election coming up, well, right? It might be sooner than later, as things shaping up on the ground. We have um, NDC executive on the ground in certain villages, in certain constituencies these days. Huh? Um, the chairman, the, the acting chairman, uh, or deputy chairman, I guess he's acting now, if, if um, the chairman, Sylvester Qualis, is in Ottawa. We don't know yet. We have no idea where he is. Um, but if he's out there, then Randall Robinson is the, is the deputy chair and would act as chair, the Gen Seg, flow member, um, flow member uh, Mr. Rahman, was um, seen in certain areas campaigning without, without the MP for that area in the town of St. George. Um, so we know that things are heating up. We've, we've seen the list and we've seen the list coded with all sorts of names we can't pronounce, especially in the South, in, in, in St. George, Northeast, um, and, and, and some of the other constituency. I'll, I'll do a piece and bring that to you. Um, lots of names, lots of, lots of names that we can't pronounce are registered to vote in the next election. I am. Uh, and probably from here on, right? So we want to uh, pull out, put out a bulletin and ask, where is our prime minister today? And who is the acting prime minister? I have a little update for you, a couple of updates, um, one of which is uh, Mr. Damien Clowden has left, have left the island finally. I think he left on Saturday last. Um, to go back to to go home, if you want to say that, to, to the U.S. by air ambulance. The GoFundMe was able to generate enough funds to pay the ambulance to take him back. We want to congratulate the administration, to congratulate the administration. They eventually came forward um, on Friday and... Um, and donated the 30,000 EC dollars to the Clowden family. As I said, they had already purchased the tickets through the GoFundMe, but of course that money can go a long way. The gentleman may not be able to work for a while. He has to take care of his family, his wife and kids, and um, their medical bills may not, be, um, may not be very small as well. So that $30,000 will come in handy. If, um, well, you say never too late. Oh, oh it, it was it was late, but it was a good gesture eventually. I mean, <laughs> persons had to get on bad and talk about it for for this to happen. But in the end, they came through. And we want to say thank you to the government of Grenada. And another update, folks, the uh the thing getting grimy. And forces are out to get yours truly. Simon says of it. Last Thursday's episode, the 3rd of September, was blocked from YouTube along with two other episodes. One of which was when we exposed what was going on in the Dubai consulate and the, the uh, remuneration of the consulate, of the consulate 
the Council General and the Council Lead, Mr. Rahman. And that is one of the ones that got blocked. Now, the host of Ride Along, Junior George, claimed his copyright on his content, claimed that he has copyright on his content, and uh, we used the clip from one of his programs without his permission. And uh, so he reported us to uh, YouTube and we got blocked. Howard, Howard, no testicular fortitude taking. Now, according to them, the NDC and their surrogates, their goons, their party hawks, the whole bunch, Simon says, and yours truly are irre irrelevant. Can you imagine if we were relevant now? <laughs> We irrelevant, but all forces have come together to get us off the air. Why? Max yourself you quite the question. Why? Because it's where truth be told. It's where facts come first. So when we speak on Simon says and we bring the facts. They say sometimes we lie. I see it posted on the on, on, on my um, YouTube channel. Jenny, you lie. What a lie about? I asked the question all the time. And I said, I text back, can you name one thing? Just one thing that I'm lying about. They disappear. Not a word. What am I lying about? I'm mean, lying. If I bring to you the facts which I do as always. How am I lying? How am I lying? What, what am I lying on? I'm lying on the facts. Can that happen? <laughs> right? So we understand clearly. But what is more concerning is that that move is in an effort to suppress the truth, to suppress freedom of speech are we back in those days i mean i know you idolize the the the, the former prime minister uh morris bishop where thousands of people persons were jailed to shut them up are we are we heading back there i have been paying attention over the past week and, and, and notice that another program is playing clips from the so-called copyright contents and they're still there no 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 um youtube block it's just me it's just me they need to stop me from bringing the truth to the people of Grenada, Karakou, and Piti Martinique, and the diaspora at large. Folks, this thing is bigger than that Popoy flute program. Way bigger. That individual was used as a pawn. And why not? After all, who plays the piper, plays the tune? <laughs> Is that what it says? Who plays the piper, plays the tune? Or what? When the dance break, we go see who paid to come in. <laughs> this is the big dogs coming up against Simon Says. Added to that, they do not want the half truths and the lies exposed and their obvious made up stories. 
You know how they just, just make up a story and put it out there and have persons believe in it. Not anymore, especially the persons in the diaspora. They were fooled for the first year. Everything going nice. So what they're trying to do is to protect that. And so that we, and Simon says, and others, do not show up the incompetence and the inept performances. Besides the Parliament of Grenada, this, that program is one of the only other place where members of this NDC cabinet and their parliamentarians can go on, make up a full story, like the, the, the CRIF being formed in 2015 and, 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 and the government then took eight years before the, um, they could join. And nobody in there said anything. I know that's in our hands that whole makeup story, nothing in it factual, nothing is it in it is true. But that in that place, you can go on there and do that as well. They're always there. Every day, sometimes three times a day, if you look by, I don't know how often the program, but if you look, you see in them in different clothes, especially with our, our acting uh, prime minister for the most part, Andy Williams. These days, he look like um, get a break. I can't all kind of rise to the top. Yeah. So that's the only other place besides the Parliament of Grenada that they can go and make up these stories and tell bold faced lies to the nation and the world at large with no remorse. But I have news for you all the horse has already bolted. And I want to go on record to say that even if I have to go on the street corner with a megaphone, I don't need a megaphone, you know, y'all hear my voice, I have projection, I don't even need a megaphone. But even if I have to go on the street corner to bring the truth to you, my people, of Grenada Carco and Pity Martinique. I will. Because you, the people, matter. You matter. I will continue to expose them. I would continue to expose the incompetence of this inept administration their nepotism, their lack of integrity, transparency and accountability, and good governance, of course, their vindictiveness and their victimization to our workers, towards our workers. I would continue to expose the corruption in every facet, every institution, every sector, and the fact that the prime minister seems to be turning a blind eye to it and in fact seems to be enabling the corruption in some cases, in some instances. Corruption in almost all, if not all of our chapters in the diaspora and the Deacon Mitchell support groups in the diaspora, the UK, Florida, Toronto, New York, New York, New York. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. Folks, just letting you all know 
that last week's episode is back up on YouTube. As a matter of fact, since Friday, we have already had, we already, when it was blocked, we had, we already had a 4.4, 4,400 views before it was blocked, just a few hours later, before 24 hours. I think it was about 12 hours when I, when I noticed it was blocked. And to date, we already gone past four, four, four Ks since it came back up. And so it's still doing all right. And so for those of you who are not aware, it's back up, it's modified, it's back up, and the others would be back up at some point as well, or unblocked, or unblocked. That's what they're afraid of. That's what they're afraid of. Simon says, is not on Facebook, where once you scroll in and you, and you stop there for a half of a second, you're going to get, it's counted as a view, whether you view it or not. We're not there. We're dealing with hardcore views, right, on YouTube. And they're afraid of that. None of them, including that Popeye flute program. Can't touch. None. You know, you know that, oh, it's the, it's the uh, most watched show. No. That's a note. That's a note. So we back up and we're ready to go again. Interestingly, one of the other episodes blocked, as I said, was the vexing episode. Uh, the the on the council general Zia Azam Rahman in Dubai. Even more interesting is the fact that Big Brother Darius Senator Salim Rahman came out on compliments the Bob the Bob report in an episode there to defend his brother. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. So Senator Sal Salim Rahman, this is what he had to say on the Bob report. Go, of course, uh your, your your brother uh who is uh, grenada's council general uh to uh the united Am arab emirates with uh which headquartered in uh, dubai uh, has been in the political news lately uh owing to uh allegations that perhaps uh, a lot of uh, what is funded for for th that the state is funding for uh, uh his stay there uh is is essentially overinflated. Uh, do you have any comments on, uh, we, we, of course, we, we are in an age of talking a lot about fiscal responsibility and things like that. Is that a conversation that you have been privy to, sir? So the short answer is no. And the long answer is that I found out, uh, you know, a lot of what is being said is being said by, by people who take a political stance. Mm -hmm. um, and and while it is important, uh, while you know, as a public servant, citizens of the country has a right have a right to look into the, the details of jobs, uh, what they do, what they're supposed to do, are they fulfilling their duties? As government has that same right, and uh, what they're being paid to do, and how are they being remunerated? So yes, that is fine, um, but. When people try to link it uh, and, and, and make politics out of it, um, you know, that's when it becomes dirty. And that's when it becomes uh, personal and so on. With regard to his remuneration, I didn't know, as God is my witness, what his remuneration was. I mean, I don't speak to him about how much he worked in for. I don't speak to anybody about that, you know. Um, so that's a private thing. But mm -hmm. I found out about it when I saw it. Uh, so it was forwarded to me. That's when I found out. When the rest on, of the on, 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 on the program. On that on the program. On, on that yeah. particular program. On uh -huh. That particular program. That's mm -hmm. when I found out. And then I saw it on another program. And that's when I said, okay, well, I guess that's what it is because they are reporting that over and over. 
Um, so, so if that were to be an O and R thing, meaning if it was that, oh, this is outrageous, how could they do something like that? Mm -hmm. they, there's no comparison. So the person that was there before, there was somebody there before him, the last administration, how much did she get? Uh, there's somebody uh, in, in London, how much is, are they getting um, mm -hmm. as compared? Because London is, a, is an expensive city to live in, as Dubai is. So is New York. So you can kind of, kind of compare. Uh, to, to just say something in a vacuum as to why they couldn't get somebody else. And so on. I think he presented his resume, uh, which I didn't even know that he did at the time. Um, and even when he was uh, going to school, I remember him saying that he wanted to do political science. And I, was, I said to him, why? Why would you want to do that? Politics is filled with so much, you know, misalignment and confusion and lies, you know, okay. generally. And that's why honest people and good people tend to shy away from politics. Not that they are not good politicians, but generally, um, you know, these people who are saying certain things are paid. They're being paid. And, uh, you know, as a Muslim, um, I'm taught that there are two muscles of flesh in the body. First of all, I want to say to the Senator, Senator Salim Rahman, big brother to our Consul General in Dubai. Your brother's job is a political job. Would your brother have been today in the United Arab Emirates, capital Dubai, if the NDC was not in office. Just answer this question. Would it? So it's a political job. Now, secondly, Senator Rahman, you spoke proudly of your faith, the Muslim faith, that is. And right before you spoke of your Muslim faith, you spoke of a rumor, a false rumor at that, and, and, and sounded it and spoke of it as a fact that, yes, that program, the host, you didn't say that, but you, were, you always spoke of that program. That program, Simon says, that broke the information, told the world Yes, it's being paid, that I'm being paid. That, Senator Rahman, is nasty. That's what it's nasty. It was a rumor, it is a rumor. And I know who started it as well. And who's spreading it as well. As I sit here, I'm Christian too from different faith but i tell you i as i sit here i can tell you that i have not been paid by no one absolutely no one i wasn't paid when i did the the, the ndc heartbeat for five years there are people who thought i was paid as well i wasn't paid not one cent and I'm not being paid today where I sit in the corner of my living room. I'm not being paid by no one. Right? No one. Y'all could say who all you want, y'all could call what name. You as a Christian, sir, and speaking of your Muslim faith, right after you told a lie on, 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 uh, 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 on national television, to the world, you told a lie because I'm not being paid. I'm not, I've said it before. And what I would like you to do, sir, if you know that for a fact, bring your facts. Bring your facts to show that me, I, Jennifer Simon Rapier, is being paid to do Simon Says. When I left the narrative, it was because I was censored and edited, and in some cases, 
the, the, the episode I, I spoke on, I commented on, was not even aired for 15 minutes, or 20 minutes, maybe as much as a 25 minutes some days. If the, the, the next uh, uh, guests didn't show up, I'll get a little more time. I left and I decided to go on my own with the encouragement of some of my fans who said to me, even before it was getting sticky, why don't you go and do your own program? That 15 minutes is not enough for us. We're not getting enough. When we start, when the things start to heat up, then you're gone. And I decided to take that leap. And I thank God for his mercies today and every day that I'm able to bring the truth to the Grenadian public. And that when I say Grenadian, I mean the state of Grenada, which involves, includes Caracou and Pity Martinique. And you out there in the diaspora who can't done thank me for bringing the news to you guys of what is happening in Grenada. You spoke, Senator Rahman, as if you have the facts. They've been paid, they've been paid. You can't, you can't, you cannot show that fact because it's not a fact. When I come to you all, I come with hardcore facts. All you always do is try to find out where I get it. No one can come and say to me that it's not true. All you do is try to find out where I'm getting it so that you can victimize some individual or individuals. You don't even know if it's coming from the public service sweeping down and pulling computers. I didn't get it there. It didn't come from there. Now you spoke of your brother's bio and his studies in political science. Does that qualify him to be a council general of political science? Him earning 45,000 one hundred and ten dollars and twenty six cents a month his earnings you all have it as his earnings it came from the government of grenada the ministry of, of foreign affairs his earnings totaling forty five thousand one hundred and ten dollars and twenty six cents the max class working a month in excess of $500,000, half a million dollars a year. In fact, $5,401, $323.18. What training or experience he has in diplomacy? in international relations or foreign and public policy? What, what, what's his training there? Because those are the criteria for ambassadors and, 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 and consul general, right? In fact, my family and friends, my good people, my followers of Simon Says, let me read to you the bio of our council general. Because this is where facts come from. And this here is the bio given to the government of Grenada because it's the cabinet that, that employed him in, in the long run. It's the cabinet that employed him. He gave his proposals. You see all this thing about is the norm? I, don't, I would like to ask the minister, Joseph Ander, if it's the norm for all of the ambassadors and council generals to sending their proposals, 
And if it's normal for the cabinet of Grenada to accept all those proposals. And he said when he was born and when he came to Grenada as a baby, blah, blah, blah. We right after birth, I came to Grenada, then the thing formative years, went to school. I attend Ridley College, where I did the Canadian equivalent of A-levels grade 12 and 13 in one year. I participated in the Ridley Cadet Corps. Cadet Corps. Thereafter, I studied political science at the University of Windsor or in Canada. We ain't know what degree get in C. Where I founded the UNICEF on campus chapter and graduated with honors. I gained useful insights and experience participating in campaigns during two federal elections. I moved back to Grenada, managed another political campaign at the constituency level in 2008. I don't know. And subsequently returned to Canada to pursue an opportunity at a Fortune 500 company in Toronto. I began my business IT career as an analyst within the Canadian region and worked my way up to production, end user testing, debugging the and roll out of new systems and tools across Brazil and the Philippines. I ended my career there as an end-to-end -end regional profit manager with responsible of the CFO for the entire Eastern Seaboard of the United States from Maine to Florida. I taught myself a few programming languages to build my own platform and began my own company, which later had a few mission shifts. I've invested in real estate and I've created my own proprietary system that allows me to imagine, to manage, I'm sorry, to manage my businesses and investments from anywhere in the world. So my man could be sitting in Dubai high and dry, collecting 45,000 plus a month and managing his businesses. And of course, collecting monies from there as well, right? I enjoy work that has the, pot the potential to positively impact upon the lives of as many people as possible. I believe in being a force for good in the world, nice, where we strive to enjoy what is good and abstain from what is not. My most recent objective has been to seek public office representing Grenada in an effort to broaden the scope of my impact and influence on impacting good to the greatest number for the longest time. I intend to use my post and my tools at my disposal to be of service to the growth, development, and prosperity of humanity. A person cannot truly be grateful to God Almighty if we are not grateful to people. It is with this mindset that I express how truly appreciative I am to my government and to the government and people of the United Arab Emirates, Arab Emirates for this tremendous opportunity. Yes, indeed. So, no. What criteria, what qualifications you hear of there that 
quite a few number of persons out there with probably even more affiliated qualifications to the job could not have gotten to go to Dubai. And that it didn't come with these huge proposals of paying school fees for children, overseas allowances, wife allowances, and the rest. All of which are penthouse allowances. And you tell talking about qualifications and, and once um, what public servants do the job. I'll come I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that next week. I already started only from last night, started to gather my, my information. Stayed up all night doing it, but it wasn't quite there to bring to you today. Because you know, you had to get it right on Simon says. Hmm? What, what, what's so special? What's so special? Now, what makes him exceptional is that with all this proposal and all these big monies, you guys in the cabinet sat down and said, it's okay. It's okay. When we have Council generals out there who are catching their tail to make ends meet. And I just want to make a note before I, I come off this that the young lady he spoke of that was in Dubai before his brother it was paid, her expenses was paid by a donor of the government of, and people of Grenada. That not one cent came from the people's money to keep her up in Dubai. It was a donor. And the person that was in the UK before the one that's there now was also paid by a donor. But we come into that next week. Don't, don't panic. Don't panic. Right? Listen. Enough of this distraction for now, for today. We take a quick break. And we come right back. Grab your popcorn and your drink. While you're out, use the bathroom. If you have to, if you need to. Because the thing now starts to heat up. We'll be right back. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe and make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode. We take a look at the education system and what's going on in there. Chaos, chaos and confusion at the moment. After the Ministry of Education press, uh, press briefing a few weeks ago where the minister announced that schools will be reopening on the 30th of September, 2024, the Minister of Karakoum Piti Martinique Affairs disclosed to the teachers and principal in Karakou that he knew nothing of it. This was not the first time they had a tug of war amongst them as to which one of them has the jurisdiction over the education system in Karikou. In a meeting in front of principals and other persons, administrative persons uh, in the Division of Education in Karikou, it was who gave you the authority? Well, I am the Minister of Education. But I am the minister in charge of Karku and Piti Martinique affairs. Nonetheless, 
even with all the apparent knowledge, the schools were reopened on the date put out, the 30th of September. The Dover school was totally destroyed and the Mount Pleasant school almost there. That's the government, two government schools I spoke of. I showed you photos when I came from Karakou. Dover was totally destroyed. And Mount Pleasant had a few walls up, but almost there. If anything, these walls would have to be knocked down anyway to rebuild. So these two government schools were positioned under tents. The president of the teachers union on a visit to Karakou was distraught when he saw the conditions that the teachers, principals, and children had to endure. This is what he had to say. We just want to show you because we're drawing attention and we're calling on the Ministry of Education to really and truly fix this situation here today. This is an emergency situation and an urgent situation. The sun is hot, the heat under which these people are under, under these tents. Children, they are sweating, they are crying. Teachers are crying out here. People are fainting here before they faint and fall here. All right? So we're asking the Ministry of Education and we're asking the government of Grenada, Karakou and Piti Matnik Affairs, to, this is an urgent situation now of today, to put things in place, mechanisms, to move the children and the teachers from this place here. You're watching and people here, they are fanning, no fan, no electricity, no nothing here inside an enclosed tent, and it is very, very hot. Teachers, everybody, uncomfortable, they're crying. They're crying out here this morning, the principal and everybody. You could see what is happening in this uh, enclosed area. Parents are coming in here and pulling out their children. They're very hot. Pulling out their children. This is not a condition under which we understand that there is a hurricane here. And we understand the effects and such. But with proper planning and discussion. And that is the reason why we are emphasizing that the Grenada Union of Teachers is not the enemy of the state or the enemy of the Ministry of Education. And so health and safety is of paramount importance for all of us. And if we come together, sit and discuss, then we're going to have better ideas and such and to be able to implement. But what we've seen here today, that is a disaster. Uh, but who cares? When the minister of Karakou and P.T. Magnique affairs is a real bad man. <laughs> One. Real bad man, real wrong from the Calabar. <laughs> real bad man, drink rum from the Calabar. <laughs> Not even temporary tiles on the ground. They are on the bare ground. When rain fall, water run under there, it's muddy. The sun shining, the heat killing them. They're not for rain, they're not for sun. That's the only two weather we have here on island. I mean, we ain't get winter and fall and spring yet. It is not conducive. It is not conducive. You can't put fan, you can't put AC, there's no way to plug it. There's nowhere to plug it in. Now, why couldn't they build some nice little wooden houses, little wooden structure, like the PS, um, Devo, uh, Javon, Javon Williams and his wife's uh, preschool that they built while Hurricane, the, the winds must be was still there. Once the, um, the, the barge from Guyana came, Get me wrong, don't get me wrong. After the barge came, the, the, the school started construction, right? So it was in that time that I just using it as a, as a, as a measurement for time. <laughs> so they started to build, right? Nice little, couldn't, if, if, 
if the government of Grenada had started to build some little structures for the Dover school at the same time, right now the children would have been in, in a little wooden structure and they would have had electricity where they could plug in fans or even put an air condition. So the principal, staff, and children would have been comfortable. Look at the look at it. I took those photos myself when I was in character. Nobody sent that for me, you know. I took it myself. Look, look, cute, nice little thing they could have built for the children before they put them under tents. Hot tent in this weather. You in AC, my friends. And all of you know it, and you're feeling hot, burning up. Schools after schools have been sending out notices to parents and guardians of the discontinuation of the school feeding program at the moment, asking parents and guardians to please send their children to school with their lunches. Here's what the children of Karaku have been receiving for breakfast. Mind you, lest we not forget, most of these kids' families are not back to normal. Their lives, their livelihoods are not back to normal where they can prepare a proper breakfast to give to the children before they go to school or even lunch to send them to school with. So they're depending on when they get to school. Well, for the most part, the schools are okay. And so they can make a breakfast for the children. But the government is who is subsidizing the entire school feeding program. Remember, in order to check boxes, they made it a free program. It's now the free school feeding program before they gave a dollar a day, right? Look at the sandwiches. Take a look for yourself at what, at what these children have to go through. Not even some butter on the dry bread. You can see, the look at it. Before they heat whatever, I don't know what that is supposed to be. For meat. I don't know. But what did the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs say to me in his interview on Heartbeat, Mr. Andal? Let's hear what he had to say to me. Child allowance for children 18 and under, or between 18 and I think 21, who are both that are recognized in the first possible again is par for the course <clears throat> dubai has a very high cost of living right. and public school as i understand public school in dubai is for the people of dubai so diplomats and other experts who live there they have to find private means to educate their children I don't know if the person with that so-called magical discovery would want the children of the Consul General to grow up illiterate and enumerate. It is very important that everybody learn to read and write and also learn to add. Oh, yeah. The so-called magical discovery. And that it is, Mr. Andel. So it's okay, Mr. Andel. To give the Consul General in Dubai, Mr. Zia Rahman, school allowances for his children, $9,531.38 per month, while our nation's kids, the rest of the kids in the nation, eating dry bread for breakfast. That is okay. You couldn't find someone who's more qualified for the job without kids that they have to take to Dubai because some of our diplomats have kids and their kids and their father wives are in Grenada. 
going to school. Okay, you don't want to separate the family. And, and that's every, you know, that's their priority, right? Don't send him. Don't send him. But all this money going to Dubai. And watch the bread now. Watch the sandwich. The children of Karku, who are already traumatized from the hurricane, who don't have a proper place to rest their head when the night come. Because these houses building back better, stronger, and safer can't show up yet. Eh? Look at the bread now. Eh? You think that's right, Mr. Andam? You really think that's fair to the children of Grenada, Karku, and Piti Matnik? This is not the norm. As you try to make us believe, the gentleman made a proposal to your cabinet and you accepted it to bring his children to you all and, 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 and made ask you all to pay their fees and you accepted it. You approved it. Did any other foreign diploma, diplomats have that pleasure? It's all politics, bro. Big brother, it's all politics. Job for the boys. And today, some of our teachers having trouble getting their salaries, two months and counting. At the press briefing, this is what the chief education officer, Mr. Dominic Jeremiah, had to say. Some of our teachers did not receive their salaries for the first payment period in the month of September. Some of the teachers affected are those earmarked for reappointment. The submission for the reappointment was completed by the Ministry of Education since June, July. The officers of the Ministry of Education must be commended for their diligence in ensuring that these submissions were made in a timely manner. The transition from the end of the original appointment to the new reappointment was not sufficient to meet the payment for the first period, payment period in the month of September. All our teachers will be fine. I have been assured by our staff of the Ministry of Education and the staff of the PSC that most of these submissions have already been completed and is been returned to the Ministry of Education for final processing, certainly for the next payment period at the end of September. So let us remember that this is a process, and sometimes the process uh, is executed flawlessly, and sometimes there are challenges uh, that we have to, we have to deal with. Um, I just want the teachers and all members of the teaching fraternity to, to rest assured that all would be well at the end of the next payment. Compliments GIS and in the same breath I apologize for the poor quality of the clip and that is coming from the thousands if not hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on equipment, new equipment for the GIS. Um, who's in charge? Our uh, creative ambassador and ICT ambassador, Mr. Orlando Romain, who's in charge of the GIS. However, my friends, at the end of September, still all of the teachers did not receive their salaries. And so the union started what I would call a mild protest. If you look on the, on the screen, you'd see a flyer telling them what to do. 
to wear the t-shirts, more or less, wear t-shirts and stand at the gate. Then more recently, in the absence of the Minister of Education, who found it necessary, together with his chief education officer, Mr. Jeremiah, who just spoke there, went to the Cayman Islands to some conference, some meeting. They don't leave out nothing, no matter what. In hurricane, they left here to go to New York, get us in and call them back. Right? Then it don't matter. We have to go. When time comes to go, they have to go. Even in the in the in the the, the, the rise of a, of a of a situation in Rwanda, uh, uh, in um, even with the outbreak of Marburg disease in Rwanda, the Prime Minister left Grenada because he has to go. When time comes to go, we have to go. So the, 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 the Minister of Education, he gone to the Cayman Islands. And sitting in for the minister is as um, acting minister of education is uh, Minister Andy Williams. He is the generic minister for all ministries, right? So he, he now was acting minister of education. The guy could hardly string two words together to make a sentence. And I mean, and I'm not being uh, malicious here. We all see it, we all hear it, we, we all know it. But he's acting Minister of Education. Now at this press briefing, this is what, and I'm going to play it, you'll hear both PSs and the Ministry of Education as two permanent secretary. Uh, permanent secretary Aaron Francois, and Permanent Secretary uh, Elvis Moray had to say. All those on the online platform, we, we welcome you to this press conference. I want to begin by saying that um, uh, around this, uh, at the start of every school year, uh, that is for the September uh, month, the Ministry of Education uh, engages in the reappointment of temporary teachers to the staff of of of, of the ministry. Um, this for this school year, we had approximately three hundred and ninety-two temporary teachers that were needing reappointment, and um, for that, the process of reappointment involves uh, several players. It involves the Ministry of Education, of course, um, submitting the application, um, preparing the applications for these uh, teachers. It also involves the Department of Public Administration, and it also involves the Public Service Commission. And so it is a process that takes place. Um, we have begun, or we began the process of the reappointment as early as June of 2024. Um, unfortunately, though, um, by the time school reopened um, in September, the process for some of the, of the teachers' reappointment was not completed. Hence the reason we had um, some um, um, delays in the payment of salaries. Um, since uh, then, um, we have been working uh, since 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 the, the the September month. We have been working um, to address the situation, and I can I can report that to date, we have um, almost uh, completed the repayment. We, we, we can assure you that by the, uh, uh, the middle of, of the week coming, all the teachers will be paid. Um, so, so that is where we are. Uh, we regret the, the inconvenience and um, the unfortunate circumstances, um, albeit it was, as I said, it, it has been a process and um, there are several entities that are involved in that process. 
And so we, we empathize with our teachers, and certainly um, we look to rectify that situation. As I said, by the middle of next week, all the teachers uh, will be. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. Uh, Piers Moreno, would you like to chime in on this? Yeah, just to um, add, let me say good afternoon to everyone, and I'm pleased to be part of this engagement this afternoon. I, I first of all want to um, empathize with the situation. I mean, teachers who find themselves didn't receive their salary. Um, I think P.S. Francois covered it nicely, but I just want to mention one part that is missing because um, you would find that at times you have some teachers who are not temporary, not reappointed, but they didn't receive salary. And, and in that case, I just want to address this. Um, many a times, and it's not, it's not something that is unique to this situation. You find a, a teacher might bump off, what we call bump off, we use the term bump off from the, the, the payroll. And the, the, the thing is that we don't know most of the time until the teacher will then reach out. Um, the thing is that I would want to encourage teachers that once you notice that happen, it is important that you get to the ministry, you know, in the shortest order. So that would help us to really expedite things because is the ministry don't really preoccupy yourself at that time with people who are prominent. Of course, you're looking for those who are temporary and how we address that. So those persons who are prominent and didn't receive the salary. You notify the ministry, you know, in short order so we can rectify the problem. I just want to add that. So P.S. Francois wanted us to believe that it was only temporary teachers, teachers on contract, that was affected by the salary payment thing, thingy that going on, right? The only ones affected was one who was newly appointed. P.S. Moraine, Elvis Moraine, on the other hand, came to just jam it in there for us that it's not only temporary teachers, but permanent ones as well was affected. And he gave us a reason why. They were, they, sometimes they get bumped off. And the deadline or the timeline given for this thing to be sorted out once and for all. That was yesterday, Wednesday, yesterday. That Wednesday was yesterday. And it did not happen. And as a matter of fact, I can also tell you that this is not just in the Ministry of Education. The issue, that issue, is probably not in that magnitude. It has been in other ministries as well. They also experiencing the same, and also workers who have been appointed, people who are appointed. They've given appointment letters over uh, one year now, some of them, and they're yet to get their raise or their back pay. Now, here is the acting minister of education in that same press conference. Let me just start by saying that when it comes to, to, to salaries, it says it's never an easy thing for an individual. And we, as an administration, understand that. And I want to add by saying that this, this issue is not a, a new issue. It's an issue that's been around for a very long time, maybe over 30 years. But we again, as an ad administration, we are committed to fixing this issue and to ensure that this is the last time some, so, so, something like this occurs. This morning, I, I had an opportunity to meet with the union. They were in Kariku, and immediately we, uh, we made a trip to go up to Kariku. And P.S. fans were from the ministry, myself, and some other delegates from the Ministry of Education. We met with the union this morning and to really communicate on this issue. And we were able to, 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 to really express the fact that we are working hard and diligently behind the scenes to ensure that teachers get, get paid on time. We, some teachers will be getting paid tomorrow 
and the remaining um, will be getting paid early next week. And we are doing our best. The staff in the Ministry of Education is doing their best to ensure that teachers are being paid. You have the Ministry of Finance is doing their best to ensure that teachers are or, or will be paid. It's a case where you have the Ministry of Education and PSE working together in to 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 really um, to to work on the issue where teachers that are reappointed uh, will be paid in in time. It happened that not all were paid on time, and this is why we have this issue. But I want you, the public, to be rest assured and teachers to rest assured that we are working diligently behind the scene. You have the staff in the Ministry of Education. They are working over time to ensure that you get paid um, in the shortest possible time. So we met with the union this morning. We communicated this with the union. So the minister, Andy Williams, P.S. Francois, and a delegation from the Ministry of Education left Grenada to go to Kariku to meet with the president of the union who lives in Grenada, who just went up to Kariku temporarily to see the mess that's going on there with the teachers and principal and so on the tent and so on and so forth. Coming back down here. All optics. So you will say, oh, it was that urgent. This thing going on, as I tell you, since the end of August, you know, the people didn't get paid end of August for the August month, and they get paid end of September. Two months, this thing going on, you know. But there was an urgency. Couldn't wait any longer because Superman has landed. Right? And so he has to leave Grenada. Remember, this is a government that operated on a $144 million deficit. A government that can't feed its children in schools. But we, we, we taking, we, we're leaving, a delegation leaving Grenada to go to Caracou to meet with the union, the, the, the president, of the teachers union who lives in Grenada for a meeting to come back down to Grenada to call a press conference. Something wrong with me because that ain't make sense. And as any young people will say, make that make sense for me if any one of y'all could. Make that make sense. And even if P.S. Moran said on sitting at that same uh, table with Superman, Superman still saying and in reiterating that it was only temporary workers that got affected. All the things I like, hear it. Our cabinet, our prime minister, the minister of education, the uh, senator. Um, David Andrew, we are committed to, to ensuring that this issue is solved once and for all. And let me clarify this. We are talking about the temporary teachers who did not get paid on time. That is what we are talking about. Uh, for some rumors speaking about public servants, that's not the case. We are talking about temporary teachers not being paid on time. I want to just put some clarity to this. So you're telling P.S. Maureen right there that he lied. You want to clarify that it's not a public service. Nobody that's permanent. It's just temporary workers. Look at you. Look at you. You don't even have no shame. Hmm? Right there and then. Because you think we're not listening. We're listening. With P.S. Maureen sitting too up from you. He just came and said... That is not just temporary workers that was affected. I continue with the acting minister of education. And I want to add by saying that this, this issue is not a, a new issue. It's an issue that's been around for a very long time, maybe over 30 years. 
So this thing been going on for a long time, as much as 30 years. Now hear this. They heard they thought and they came from the Ministry of Caribbean PD Matting Affairs and other persons. They were exposed to this because it was made to believe that it was just temporary teachers that were in that situation. And by temporary, even the press conference from the Ministry of Education, what they did with the deceitfulness, you know what they did? They also kind of take it to the nation and twist it to make the nation believe that it was only teachers. This problem is just for teachers who now coming in in the system, coming in and they get a job in September, so they did not get paid. And this is the farthest from the truth. If this situation were, let's say, teachers who just get a little job, a little work in September, and that happened, then that would have been a little bit more reasonable because the process. But that is not what happened. And is in this day and age, where in other ministries that workers are paid every month and on time, is it only in the Ministry of Education? This thing continues to happen like a recurring decimal. And for these people in the Ministry of Education to go on the record and to tell the nation, as if well, the teachers that have the problem, and they know that that thing has been going on for 30 years, that is a lie. And it is painful and hurtful. It makes the matters worse. It makes matters worse. When teachers listen to this press conference by the Ministry of Education and others to say that that problem has been going on for 30 years. Which 30 years? Which 30 years? And brothers and sisters, my fellow citizens, even if this problem has been going on for 30 years, that is no excuse for this administration and the Ministry of Education to leave it that way. Because the Grenadian citizenry has really and truly voted for change and put persons in change to really and truly in situation to really and truly to remedy and to rectify anomalies and past occurrences of, of what used to happen before. So we take no excuse and the nation should not fall in that sort of trap with the craftiness the kind of anansi thing, the guileness, and whatever persons from the Ministry of Education went there in this press conference to do, to try to make the teachers look bad. So what did- Which 30 years? Eh? Which 30 years? Ebe eh, Anansi? <laughs> and that's our best minister, eh? That's our best minister. That's how easy it is to come to us with lies and have truth and made up stories and that's why simon says is here that's why it is just amazing how in this administration tongue and cheat don't communicate tongue and cheat have no idea what's going on with each other do you know that the Minister for Health had no clue that his government had made a $30,000 donation to the Clowden family before the rest of us? When we found out, that's when the Minister of Health found out tongue and cheek, they in war, it seems. <laughs> but shouldn't it be a cabinet decision, though? I mean, just to sign off on $30,000 for Mr. Claude. Where Mr. Uh, the Minister of Health sits, he sits in the cabinet of Grenada. And it's just amazing. The little things like that. I mean, they can't get nothing fixed right nothing goes smoothly to say yeah boy they get that one right they get they got that right and it seems like among them they are sabotaging each other or at least trying to sabotage one another and instead their surrogates are calling foul on public officers. The acting minister of education flying all the way to Karakou 
to meet with the union leader, returns to Grenada, have host a press conference to act like he's responsible, all for the optics, while the Minister of Education is away and saying that this thing would be remedied in two days. Because he said we pay some today and by tomorrow, Wednesday, the rest would be paid. Something the minister and his two PSs and the rest of the ministry couldn't solve, has not been able to solve in two months. But Superman, according to the optics, solved it in two days. And then you see on the front page of the rags that Minister David Andrew have to go. Need I say anything more? Why wasn't the Minister for Health? I hear he have to go to the stop off. We want to spend it here. I hear he have to go to the Minister for, for Health. Uh -huh. he have to. In an effort to try to make themselves feel and look good, they've decided to blame the workers, the public workers, for their failed government. And I say, shame on them. Crying sabotage. What have they sabotaged? You ain't do nothing. You have no policies. Huh? What, what, what is sabotage again? You could only sabotage something that's there. You have no plans, no programs, no new capital projects. What have they sabotaged? Really? What? Tell me. Eh? Eh? What the public workers sabotaged? It? Our public workers' moral is at an all-time low. In the words of workers who've been around for 20, 25, 30 years, the lowest it has ever been. Workers bursting into tears when speaking of the level of intimate, intimidation and victimization and vindictiveness and, and, and let me just say here, victimization doesn't always mean somebody get fired. People can be victimized right where they sit in their office or offices at the ministerial complex. But in order to to, to hide the incompetence and their performances. Sabotage, sabotage day, radio, Facebook, all the ones who normally would protect, and not much, eh? about five of them. All you see over the past couple of weeks, sabotage, sabotage, sabotage. So the poor public workers know is who they're going at. Because listen, we're in midterm. And after midterm, you know what happens. Man could, could ring the bell anytime, right? And so they decide to blame the public workers for their underperformances. To take the brunt it not gonna happen. Every ministry, they have sabotage. Your own people, y'all put the, 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 the wrong pegs, y'all put in the square holes. They sabotage it too. Your own people, y'all make PS and who, 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 who in deserve it, who deserve it. They sabotage it too because they're in charge in, in, in some of the ministries. Eh? <laughs> what a crock. You only 
going to get nowhere with it. So y'all could might as well stop. Stop. So we're moving on. Full speed ahead. The throne speech, my friends. So we went on the way to recurrent expenditure and estimates 2025, AKA the budget 2025. The throne speech has been read all 20 minutes, 12 seconds of it. They went from golden jubilee to straight to burial. So from the 7th of February to the, 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 the 1st of July. Grenada has managed to break another record, a throne speech record. Let's hear what the general, uh, Governor General had to say. As we gather today to mark this third session of the 11th Parliament, I am reminded that the strength of our democracy lies in our collective commitment to work together in the best interest of the citizens of Grenada, Cariacou, and Pitti Martinique. Today, I stand before you with a great sense of pride and gratitude because despite the challenges of this year, our collective commitment to serve our beloved nation has never been greater. Golden Jubilee. On February the 7th, 2024, our nation marked its 50 years of independence, a defining achievement for our country under the theme, One People, One Journey, One Future, a testament to the strength, resilience, unity, and triumph of our people. This historic milestone was marked by a year-long commemorative celebration of events, projects, programmatic and policy initiatives truly befitting of our golden jubilee and which will culminate this month with the St. David's Parish celebrations. Notably, the celebratory activities included the issuance of a 50th anniversary independence commemorative EC $50 note, which is currently in circulation, the declaring of 19th October as a national public holiday in solemn recognition, reflection, and appreciation of the sacrifices of our heroes, the introduction and teaching of Grenadian history in our schools, which began in September of 2023, the publication of a 50th anniversary magazine, which documents the stories of past and present Grenadians who have made significant contributions to our beloved nation, the establishment of the CARICOM roundabout which saw the attendance of CARICOM leaders during the recently held 47th meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community. Parish activities culminating in a magnificent National Independence Day parade with a spectacular drone and fireworks show which depicted the creativity of our people the historic influencers who shaped this nation's de destiny and our iconic landmarks. Folks, MDC made yet another mess of an event. I mean, the throne speech you. What else could go wrong? The Governor General was given a lectern that stood way below her waistline. So she had to pick up, pick it up and read from it. And while she's speaking, when they realized that the one they had was too low, they then brought one, while she's speaking, a taller one, 
and put down. Now, it had to be a curse. No one, even people who, I mean, supposed to know, don't know anymore. What is that? Eh? And it was just as saying, but Lord, they can't see that too low. The lectern, it was too low. And then I see the gentleman coming over with the taller one. Nonetheless, she spoke with, and I quote, a great sense of pride and gratitude. And then she, they, went straight from the Golden Jubilee celebrations to Hurricane Barrel. Now, on the Golden Jubilee, our government spoke of celebrate, celebratory activities, which includes the issuance of the commemorative EC $50 note, the declaring of the 19th of October as a national holiday. Hear this. In solemn recognition, reflection, and appreciation of the sacrifice of our heroes. The introduction and teaching of Grenada history in our schools from September 2023. The publication of the 50th anniversary magazine, which documents the stories of past and present Grenadians who have made significant contributions to our beloved nation. Establishment of the CARICOM roundabout. I didn't know that was part of the Golden Jubilee. I found that out in the, in the, in, 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 in the um, throne speech. Attendance of CARICOM leaders during recently held 47th meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of the Caribbean Community, CARICOM. Now, when did the CARICOM roundabout meeting and the meetings of the heads of government became a part of the Golden Jubilee celebration? I guess it's since the admin, the, the opposition, and um, some of us have been asking for a breakdown of how the $22.5 million was spent. I guess since then, a lot of other things was added onto the menu. In the 2024 supplementary budget, on the vote 10, $2.5 million was allocated for the hosting of the CARICOM meeting held in July 2024 and chaired by Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell. And it says here, let me get my specs. Vote 10, Office of the Prime Minister, $2.5 million. Hosting of CARICOM meeting, which will be held in July 2024 and chaired by Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell. All allocation was provided in the budget for the hosting of the meeting as decision was taken within the year to host the cost associated with hosting and with hosting to be paid within this year. A piece of the thing missing on the side there. How it done was right. So it was allocated. We had an allocation in the supplementary budget, but here it is posing under, according to the throne speech, the Golden Jubilee. And then we had the parish activities and, and the spectacular drone show and fireworks show, which depicted the, the creativity of our people, the historic influences who shaped this nation's destiny and the iconic landmarks. We still 
don't know how much for the drone show. They're still hiding that amount from us. Yeah? The spectacular drone show. I take you back to the second item under the Golden Jubilee. The declaring of the 19th of October as a national holiday. And I quote, in solemn recognition, reflection, and appreciation of the sacrifices of our hero. Now, who are these heroes? Why the whole back? Since October 19, 2023, we were supposed to establish a hero's park and start naming our heroes. Now, that was in addition to a long list of events and activities given to us by the creative director himself and member of the celebrations committee, Mr. Orlando Rumi. Within that phase, we, we have planned out 21 national events. Um, those are events that will be executed by the state um, and we also have uh, events that we will endorse from the, the private sector. There are a lot of persons who have reached out to the Secretariat um, wanting to do events around independence, and they, we are evaluating those events, and we will then endorse some of these events as uh, additional events for the public to participate in. The official pre-independence uh, celebrations will start in October 19th and will end on February 9th, 2024. All right, we, we've also uh, curated a special list of events um, uh, from June, from January 28th, 2024 to February 9th, 2024, that would allow not just Grenadians, but persons in the diaspora to ensure that they can come back and participate in those, that block of events. So it's going to be about 10 days of intense events and activities and celebrations that the diaspora uh, uh, will be able to participate in. Um, and any foreign foreign person who wants to come in to participate in, in our independence can do so. Uh, we will make that full list of events available so persons can begin their pre-planning and booking for the event. We expect to see a lot of persons on island um, and we expect for it to be uh, events that are well attended um, and, and well executed. The events will span from sporting events to festive events to cultural events to academic slash conference type events. We have a plethora of different activities to ensure that we uh, cover all aspects of our 50 years of independence, our history, our people, and our, absolutely our future. We also will see the installation of several sites of memories across the island, which is quite important for us to really document and, and iconize our, our histories, our history, and our, our people. So you will see the installation of monuments and, 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 and statues, um, the renaming of streets and several other activities that will really help define uh, Grenada in this uh, modern, modern time. A plethora of activities. Okay, what are these monuments and statues and name street changes and, 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 and sports and uh, culture and what? Uh, six events. Or items were named in the in 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 the in the throne speech six, right? And we hear him there. How many of those events and activities happened in earnest? How many? We're still waiting for the the private citizens' events, that calendar of events that private citizens wanted to do. We're still waiting on the 10 days of intense events, activities, and celebrations. How about the installation of monuments? Where are they? Where are the statutes? How about the renaming of the streets? And then there was the establishment of Heroes Park. And that was the item that was our event, whatever you want to call it, I don't know, that was supposed to take up the brunt of the $22.5 million, as was said. Uh-huh. Here is clip. 
October 19th, 2023 will be a national holiday and will continue as a permanent holiday on the country's calendar in recognition of the events that occurred on that day. This is one of the many planned activities being executed by government as the country prepares to celebrate its 50th anniversary of independence. Prime Minister Honorable Deacon Mitchell speaking at a media briefing this week also mentioned the establishment of Grenada's first ever National Heroes Park. As part of the 50th anniversary celebrations as well, covering the, the entire year, uh, the government intends to embark upon uh, with public support and consultation, the naming of our first national heroes as part of our 50th anniversary celebrations. And so uh, we certainly will have names proposed and we would invite feedback from the public. Uh, we are hoping that we can name a minimum of three and perhaps no more than five national heroes, um, because obviously uh, being recognized as a national hero is the highest uh, award or honor that any nation can bestow upon its citizens. Um, and so we are looking forward to, to that happening. We also anticipate, uh, and at a further briefing, we will uh, indicate once we are able to successfully do so, we also anticipate being able to uh, uh, acquire lands uh, that we can dedicate to creating a national heroes park, uh, where those persons who are in fact named as national heroes, where uh, some bus or other memorabilia of uh, them can be erected um, at the national park. Um, and this is uh, a venture that we are quite excited about. Uh, we hope um, that by the time we get to the official launch of our 50th uh, anniversary uh, celebrations commencement, that we would be in a position to provide further details uh, to members of the public on, on this initiative. The 7th February came and went. No naming of heroes, no heroes pop. But as we saw, as GIS spoke of heroes, whose image was on the screen, right? In the whole heroes clip, we saw Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Morris Bishop image. The Prime Minister came back to tell us that the lands identified was in fact the former Rivera property owned by Mr. Nagib Sararis of the uh, Silver Sands grouping, and that was swapped with us, the people of Grenada, for the Kawana Bay property up there at the top of Mon Rouge. And um, along with the Rivera, I think we got a eight million, eight million US dollars or EC dollars. I think it's EC dollars with that um, with that property to put the Heroes Park. And so, um, let's hear what the Prime Minister had to say. The lease for the Kuana Bay and the surrender of the Rivera site on Grandin's Beach were signed by the Governor General of Grenada, Dame Cecil Lagrenade, and investor Nagib Sauriris. The signing was labeled as symbolic as it underscores government's dedication to responsible land use and community engagement. The agreement was sealed during a ribbon cutting ceremony on Monday for the commissioning of Silver Sands Beach House in Point Celine. Prime Minister Honorable Deacon Mitchell believes partnerships are an important part of nation building. Sometimes, and I will say so openly, uh, we could be a little hesitant uh, to be welcoming to foreign direct investors and to persons who visit Grenada and find Grenada a wonderful place that they wish to do business with, oftentimes because of the warmth and friendliness of our Grenadian people. So it's important for both of us, those of us who are here and those who wish to come here, that we understand each other, that we interact with each other, and that we build a culture of partnership, not a culture of xenophobia or them against us. We are not going to work if we are not partners and if we are not speaking with each other to ensure that we are on the same page and that we find mature ways to settle disagreements which will happen from time to time or differences of perspectives. I think the fact that we're here successful in record time is an indication uh, that the people of Grenada, not just the government of Grenada, find Nagib and his team a wonderful partner. The government of Grenada and a group of U.S. investors that had been working through True Blue Development to build the Kiwana Bay Resort near world-famous Grand Dance Beach jointly announced the resolution of a dispute that had been under arbitration since 2021 before the World Bank's International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. 
Following a short period of study and design, the Silver Sands team will restart construction at the Kuana Bay site to complete a five-star resort. Owner of the Silver Sands Hotel is Nagib Sawiris. In the first hotel in Silver Sands, there was no CBI. We, I invested $180 million from my own money, no bank, no loans, no CBI, and built this hotel because my point was that we need to at attract people to Grenada and they need to know that they can come to a beautiful hotel and that uh, all these beautiful hotels are not just in Barbados or St. Bart, but also on this beautiful island that deserves these hotels because its people are one of a kind. I tell you, I mean, the highlight of my day is always my seven o'clock walk on the beach when I see the local people here and how uh, and their daily gatherings in the water five and, in five and six groups, peaceful and friendly, you know. So. I hope that uh, God will bless me for, uh, for doing all that. And Part of the deal for the Kuana Bay site was a surrender of the Rivera site, which sits adjacent to the Common Park on Grandin's Beach. The expanded public park will be declared National Heroes Park in recognition of past and present heroes. Reporting for MTV News, I am Akila Aberdeen. So, the Rivera property was named National Heroes Park. But in more recent times, we've learned from the number one minister. Listen, and I say that with such heartbreak. We're in real trouble, you know. We're in real trouble. In a Facebook page, in a Facebook post, right? If you look on your screen, you'd see that Heroes Park is on hold for now. And I quote, plans are on the on the way. As a matter of fact, it was spelled U-N-D-E-R-W-A-Y. I don't know what I mean, but I'm guessing it meant are on the way. Plans are on the way. <laughs> and he was acting minister of education, eh? Um, to develop Rivera into our heroes park. However, in the interim, we can create some business opportunities for our people. So as I understand it, it's going to be a vending area. You see the clear off, even went with some of the trees that um, Silver Sands grouping made sure never to cut down, even when every now and again, they would clear the bushes. They, leave, they left those trees standing. Right now, we flatten that, and we come in with probably another uh, another vending area. And so that makes you think, if you're going to put vendors there or businesses, whatever type of businesses, when are we going to get it back for Heroes Park? Because you're not going to have people set up their stuff there, there and in two months say, you all got to go. I highly doubt. And not with an election coming up, that won't happen. So in my mind, that's the beginning and the end of Heroes Park. In the meantime, the Minister for Tourism and Culture, Adrian Persuader Thomas, hosted a press conference along with Miss Jackie Alexis. I think it's chair, she's the chairman of the National Events Committee. Let's get our introduction. Um, National that. Heroes Day is always an important venture, especially when you're honoring the sacrifices that's people have made in the past in, for the development and the building of your country. Um, it's, it is also an opportunity to promote national identity. Um, if you do not know where you come from, you may not know where you're, where you're going. So this is, it is very important that we celebrate um, all our heroes who may have contributed some way or the other um, in terms of giving us Grenadians a, a sense of identity and also unity. Um, the whole issue of inspiring our, fu our future generation, um, if you do not honor those who made the sacrifice in the past, if you do not recognize the work um, as some form of inspiration for the building of our nation, then really and truly you may have lose, lose your identity as a, as, a, as a people. The whole issue of reflecting on the work 
that was done before is, is, is crucial in terms of going. And, and we do have a civic responsibility in terms of letting the nation know the people that have laid the foundation in order for it to go forward. Um, if we, in summary, if we, say, if we celebrate National Heroes Day, um, just as remembering it, it may not make sense. So you want it to be a celebration of resilience, of identity, um, ongoing journey towards a better society. It serves as a reminder of the values and principles that unite the nation and inspires individuals to contribute significantly in terms of going forward. So <laughs> really and truly persuaded. Well, you just say it. I tell you, the United Nations following the thing, I don't know where, how, why. I mean, identity and what? What, 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 what you just said there. The minister continued by saying, heroes pop can be anywhere. Two of the things that we indicated last year in regards to the, the naming of our national heroes were, this is work in, 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 in progress. We have the committee already established. They are developing the criteria in terms of how we go about selecting um, national heroes. And come 2026, October 2026, we will be naming some of the national heroes that we are, we are hoping will inspire our Grenadian people and, and they will be well established and well known throughout the world. So that is in motion. And another important point is the whole issue of um, establishing a hero's pack. We have already identified the land. We can, it, it, can, it can be changed if, if through a consultation people think that um, the best place may not be Commonwealth Park in St. George. It might be some place in St. Liposil in St. Patrick. Then we can have that discussion. But come 2026, we will be, a, we will be um, turning the sword for to come 2025, sorry, we'll be turning the sword for the establishment of a hero's pack where the, the, we, we can decide what, whether we um, put up plaques, whether we put up walls, whatever, whatever monument we'll be using, um, come 2025, we'll definitely be having that. So for 2024, National Heroes Day will be celebrated on the 19th of October, Progress Park St. Andrew. No, what plaques and walls have to do with the hero's pack? Huh? You, you, you identified property for Heroes Park, it was said. The Prime Minister said, now you're talking about consultation and it could change to Leapers Hill and <laughs> all of good way. <laughs> I say it again, I say it before, I say it again, all it take away because it's so confusing just to listen to you guys. It's so confusing. Eh? A simple thing as for heroes park and, 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 and. Let, let, let's hear him on the question of criteria for the heroes. So I would just like you or uh, Mr. Alexis just to give a little further bit of information. You mentioned that the committee is already in place. So persons within the various communities who may have someone that they would like to put forward you know, for the committee, what what will be that? What will the process entail in terms of gathering the information before you have the the actual committee sit and decide whether or not that particular individual is worthy of being within the heroes path? Oh, right. <laughs> well, the the consultation will have to be will have to take place. Um, through the community of Grenada Carico and PT Matnik. Um, once they, they come up with the criteria, um, they, as a starting point, the committee may come up with some ideas. Okay. But we have to, we will consult with the general public and they may have brilliant ideas in terms of what we establish as our policy in terms of going forward. And once once that has been done, then um, whoever is being nominated will have, they will examine the criteria, they fall within the criteria. And um, and remember, National Heroes it doesn't start from today or from 1983. It's go it goes way back when. Who knows? Julian Fellow might be an, one of our national heroes that we need to we need to celebrate. And he was there sometime in in the 18th century. So um, it is important that we, we we consult as wide as possible, and we do the necessary research too. Um, there are countries who have gone through the process of 
establishing national heroes. There's a, a blueprint that they may have. Yeah. Um, we do not want to go and reinvent the wheel, so we may just examine some of the, the, those that have been done in the past. I think Barbados was the latest who have established um, a few national heroes, and I mean, it's, it's a beauty to, to encounter and talk to Sir Gary Sobers, who is still a living legend. Um, he is one of Barbados' national heroes. Um, so we can examine what they have in place, the structure they have in place, and we can um, um, adopt and tweak to talk about it. Hey. Let's go in the dictionary or Google it. You don't need to go to Barbados to find out what they're going to do, how they, their structure of naming their heroes. <laughs> Listen, no, um, <laughs> just more rubbish and more rubbish. No question on the actual October 19th holiday. So the, the, the National Heroes Commission has nothing to do with who gets in or what? No. Okay. Um, at the start of the news conference, there was uh, another... Um, audio in the background, so I will not hear it very clearly. Um, can you reiterate or tell me whether or not the 19th will be a holiday, a national holiday? It is a national holiday as declared since last year. It is not in the list of bank holidays for Grenada. Um, I checked up to um, earlier this week. Can you tell me what right, well, I'm telling you? I'm telling you no, I'm telling you no, that October 19th is a public holiday for 2024. When will it be gasseted? Because it was not in the bank holidays as required in law. Okay, um, I don't know if I don't know if you want to get into an argument with that, but um, it is a I'm public holiday arguing, for just... it is a holiday for 2024, and and, and it's going to be a holiday in 2025 also, and it was a holiday in 2023. Can you share why it has not been listed on the bank list of bank holidays? No, I can, I cannot tell you that now. Thank you very much, Ms. Straker. Do we have another member of the media? It wasn't, um, she wasn't arguing. She was holding you accountable and your government, I should say, for not abiding by the laws of the country. It's supposed to be gazetted, just like the, 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 the boards for the statutory bodies. And some of them are gone full term without being gazetted. That's all she was doing. It gets worse, folks. So the, my first question, I have about three to four questions. My first question, the committee that was mentioned, is it um, was it established in accordance with the National Honors and Heroes Award um, Act, which was approved and passed in 2007? She uh, she's asking if the committee that has been established, if it, if it was done with reference to the National Awards and Heroes Act, I think that was passed back in 2007. Uh, yes, I believe it that um, that is the case. I mean, as we said, that the the um, committee is in place and the committee is working towards the uh, working within the, the protocols and processes that were laid out. Can you tell me who are the question? members of the committee and who is the chair? The members of the committee and the chair. Um, I'm sorry, I can't give you that detail right now, but um, I'm happy to find out for you and um, provide you with it. Can the minister thought, please assist? Or, because he mentioned it, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, I thought you were talking about the, the, you're talking about the organizing committee for this occasion? No, the, the committee that will be awarding people, the, the National Honors and Award Act of 2007, provides for establishing a National Heroes Commission. That's right. what I'm speaking yes, yes. about, get, to award where, heroes. So who are the members from. of that committee? Yes, I get where you're coming from. I cannot give you the list of the members right now, but the, the committee, um, we just, only last week, they submitted a report in terms of how far they are, in terms of where they're going. But I could always, always follow share with the list of the, um, the members of that, of that particular committee. Um, I think it was Mr. Alexis that called for, um, say, people if they're ready to, to organize buses and so to check with the parliamentary, um, office, the parliamentary elections office. 
are you going to um, conclude? Um, can she tell us when the MPs who are not members of government let's say were are notified that the offices would be a focal point for organizing um, persons to go to the event on um, the 19th? When were they notified? All, all of the parliamentary offices have been notified that there is buses available to them. At this point, we um, allocated three per, per parliamentary office, um, and they were given the option as if they felt they could fi they could fill more buses, that they would be allowed more buses. My question was not how much buses. When were they notified? They were, were they notified within, last week, September, August? No, they were they were notified within the last forty eight hours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Um, so the, my my final question is: We, the persons who will be um, recognized on the nineteenth, are these people going to be recognized in accordance with also the same law? Or are they being organized because the committee is of the opinion that they should be recognized? Because the law laid down how people can be should be recognized. Twenty twenty four. I am. I didn't hear what you said. I do not understand your question in regards to um, how will the. Are Ms. you talking about the awardees or the people that will be? Yeah, Mister Mister Alexis said that a number of persons will be recognized. Yes. My question is, are these people being recognized at the wish of the committee or are they being recognized as established in the law? Because the law provides on criteria. No, they will, be, they will be recognized in regards to the, the committee and in consultation with the community in which they live. The Lucro Act, like what act? Act? You don't know, remember me? Tanti Globe. What is Tanti Globe? The question about the housing. And Tanti Globe. And right there, they make up a story. They didn't know which way's up. They have no clue what they were talking about. Right? And the whole thing, if this is what we're getting from the leaders of what of this Heroes Park uh, October 19th celebration thing, you could imagine the mess we're going to end up seeing up there at, at Progress Park. And wherever they decide to put Heroes Park, if it's in um, in Lippers Hill or, or, or the big stone or wherever else, or by the stone. Because he said it could go anywhere, anywhere. Just to advise, the minister warned there must be no partying and drinking and drunking on the day of October 19th. I'm not sure if it's gazetted, I'm not sure what it is, but as I understand it, um, there be no there should be no amplified music and on that day, no partying, no drinking of alcohol. And, and, and drunken on the day, October 19, 2024. On April the 14th, 2024, a government delegation headed by Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell returned from Cuba. And at a press briefing at the MBIA, this is what the Prime Minister had to say. Uh, thank you, Press Secretary. Pleasant afternoon to members of the media who are joining us and those who are witnessing this brief press conference live. I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Joseph Andal, our foreign minister, who was part of the delegation that accompanied me to Cuba. Also, uh, Honorable Philip Telesford, Minister for Health, the Honorable David Andrew, Minister for Education, uh, the Honorable Lennox Andrews, Minister for Economic Development, Agriculture, Lands, Forestry, uh, Marine Resources. Uh, other members of the delegation included Mr. Olamdo Romain, advisor to the government on ICT and the creative economy. I want to, in particular, pay tribute to Excellency uh, Ambassador of Cuba to Grenada, who accompanied us uh, on the trip and who uh, played a significant role in ensuring uh, that we really had a wonderful experience, a learning experience, and an experience of true camaraderie uh, with the people and government of Cuba. We. So 
as we stand today to mark 45 years of diplomatic relations between the Republic of Cuba and the people of Grenada, uh, which was established one month and one day uh, after the triumph of the People's Revolutionary Government in 1979, 45 years today, we stand on hollow grounds, perhaps the most signature and monumental testament of Cuba's friendship with the people of Grenada at this the Morris Bishop International Airport. Uh, and so if there is any doubt that Grenada has benefited tremendously, particularly economically, uh, from our friendship and fraternity with Cuba, this Morris Bishop International Airport stands as a testimony to that bond and to that friendship. And so, uh, Ambassador, again, I want to take the opportunity to thank you and to thank the people of Cuba for their friendship, uh, for their fraternity, and for their brotherhood. The three-day uh, meeting in Cuba uh, involved a number of meetings. Uh, the meetings ranged from a full-fledged meeting with His Excellency Miguel Diaz Bermudez, President of Cuba. We also met with the Prime Minister of Cuba. We met with the Foreign Minister and other senior cabinet members of Cuba, as well as senior uh, officials of the Cuba Communist Party. The delegation also had the opportunity to visit uh, significant institutions in Cuba. Many of these institutions tell the history, the struggle, the success, and the triumph of the Cuban people, and how that success has not just benefited Cuba, but has benefited Grenada, CARICOM, and the world. As you are aware, Grenada has a significant bilateral relations with Cuba, and uh, we cooperate in a number of areas. The ministers who accompanied me to Cuba uh, did so because of the particular areas of interest uh, that we have cooperated with Cuba over the years. Uh, the highlight of the visit included the signing of four bilateral cooperation agreements, and we will provide greater details on these uh, during the coming week. Uh, we anticipate further agreements to be signed, including uh, with later this month uh, when the Minister for uh, Culture and Tourism visits Cuba. But I just want to highlight a, a couple of things. One, uh, we visited Santiago de Cuba uh, just before arriving back from Grenada. Uh, Santiago boasts as being the most Caribbean of, of Cuba. Uh, and there are a number of significant uh, issues arising out of the, that visit. And I would perhaps say the most significant being this. As you are aware, there isn't a single statute or bus in tribute to our fallen former Prime Minister, the Morris Bishop, Morris Bishop in Grenada. Uh, but at the Casa de Carib in Santiago, there stands a beautiful statue of us in tribute to Morris Bishop. We had the opportunity to meet uh, with the son of the sculptor uh, that operates a foundation and a company uh, that has significant experience and expertise in the creation of us. We engaged in discussions surrounding uh, commissioning a bus to represent Morris Bishop and the 18 colleagues who were killed on the 19th of October 1983 uh, to be done by the sculptor and his foundation. And so we anticipate that uh, before October 19th, 2024, that we will have a bus of Morris Bishop together with the 18 colleagues who fell. And more importantly, we will signal the commencement of a relationship with that foundation to teach Grenadians, students in particular, uh, the art of bus making, the art of sculpture, and all that goes with it. So we are with the bust of Morris Bishop and the 18 who was assassinated on Fort, what we call Fort Rupert at the time in St. George. We await this bust of 
Mars Bishop that was supposed to get here for October 19, 2024. Well, we have a few days left. It might be on its way down. So let's see if we get this bust before the, um, the celebration or on that day. Well, we all know of um, Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell infatuation with Morris Bishop, hence this portrait or of the on the backside of the fifty dollar bill that is uh, Morris Bishop's portrait, with no thought into it that the former and deceased Prime Minister uh, Prime Minister Eric Gary, whose government was overthrown by guns by the Mars Bishop and the NJM. Um, he is on the front side. So um, maybe they're trying to reconcile the differences between these two parties. I have no idea they are both dead. Um, and so Prime Minister Deacon Mitchell, sir, your infatuation with Maurice Bishop has angered some persons in different quarters out there, uh, at home and abroad, at home and in the diaspora. Here's one such person. My problem today, ladies and gentlemen, everybody know who I am. I mean, <laughs> I've been around, particularly in the NDC camp uh, for a long time. I want to say emphatically that I, Dennis Charles, I don't feel at home any longer in the NDC party. And I'm going to be blunt as blunt could be. I don't know what the hell is going on or who is giving who advice with the blunders consistent blunders, one mistake after another mistake, piling on each other, going on in the NDC. I am ashamed of myself. I personally put my, you know, life on the line, if you will. I went home on many occasions. My resources were poured into the NDC. My energies, my effort over the years, it's not today. I've been an NDC. As I said before, I've been in the NDC camp, in the circle of the NDC. I'm not in Grenada, yes. <clears throat> I'm here in America, over 33 years. What we have today in the NDC is not NDC. What we have today is the RMC. We have gone back to 1979, back into the Grenada Revolution, when we should be going forward unfortunately i'm gonna play a little song and then i'll continue but i have some very big decisions uh, that i i want to announce and going forward i would not let those who think they could you know bamboozle people i had no idea this was where we're heading this was where we're going for those who suffered at the hands of the prg and the pra and all of that to come now and have these young guys just throwing cold water on you like you don't exist when grenadians bled and died and suffered what they were tortured many were raped who were killed execution style on the orders of maurice bishop you're gonna pick our heroes for us without asking our consent or our permission who the hell give you authority your hero belongs to you you could hang up your hero in your bedroom don't impose your hero on me and if you want a motorcade i'm gonna tell you what to do with the motorcade when you pass through you know wherever you start or end i don't know with your motorcade on october 19th passing planes and stopping the junction coming from coquelin and look for the bullet holes. I could tell you the houses to go where the PRA soldiers executed Steve Lalsi. 
where the PRA soldiers, most of them from Sotte's militia camp, the villa, executed the Stanislas brothers and Andy Courtney, young Andrew, he went uh, to McDonald College with me. You guys are jokers in the NDC. You want to go back to the revolution? Fine. Create your own party, call it the new revo, and go. You don't come and hijack the NDC all along your RMC, pretending to be NDC. Trust me, election coming. I'm going to be there. Election is coming not too far from now. You guys are going to learn a hard lesson. If it's stupid, all you're stupid. All you're going to learn a hard lesson. It's coming. Trust me. Because where I come from, my neck of the woods, I have seen torture. I know what brutality is. I know what it means to be under heavy manners, as we used to say. And as Morris Bishop used to boast on the radio, boasting when he locked up Tillman Thomas, Lloydwell, and, and, and Leslie Pierre, his own law friend, boasting that he has Lloydwell and them under heavy manners up in Richmond Hill, the same Tillman and Lloydwell and, and, and others that used to hang with him, bodies. If he get a chance, he lock up his shadow and he gonna make him a hero because you say so. Well, who give you that authority? We're going to find out. Election coming. Folks, Mr. Charles had a lot more to say. I therefore will share it with you. Uh, we would upload his entire video on the Simon Says channel. Is it true the financial complex would be moved to... The Galleria Mall in Grand Anse, that's the former Cap Bank building, paying a total of $250,000 a month for rent, little parking right next to the traffic light, uh, an already congested traffic area. The top two floors would be rented out. Uh, for the, min, the, min, the financial complex, the top floor is a hotel, and each office will have its own toilet and bathroom. NDC rented a hotel for office space. We are paying for a hotel when they're right next door. I can I, I can suggest right next door the financial complex. Uh, Hubbard's just renovated a whole block of, of, of new space there. On the other side, we have the W. Julian building that they're using partly now for the inland revenue, um, part of the inland revenue. We have government buildings throughout, um, quite a few in St. George's that can be renovated and, and, and used instead of repaying $250,000 a month for rent in well using part of a hotel to we're using a hotel really to do so um is it true that one of the prime minister's advisors brother now owns that building who's advising who on what minister joseph andel again who is ambassador Yvette Philbert? I'm going to put up a, some sort of certificate thing there with her name and her carrying the um the title ambassador who is ambassador Yvette Philbert. We're quickly well, we have run out of time. <laughs> let's needless to say, I need to ask the prime minister where he's at with the investigation on the Lotto, the, the Grenada Lottery Authority corruption, and where is a where he is if there is one on the investigation on the bribery that took place between one of your cabinet ministers and a contractor to do with the Cliff Road project, the hundred thousand dollar 
shake hand and the fifteen thousand dollars that went towards the renovation of the minister's vehicle we're going to stop here for today that's a wrap on today's episode of simon says thank you for joining us for yet another conversation keeping them honest Thank you for joining Simon Says, where facts come first always. See you next week, same time, same place. Bye now. Thank you for tuning in to Simon Says. To ensure that you never miss an episode, click subscribe. And make sure to turn on the notifications by clicking on the notification bell icon. See you at the next episode.